Welcome to Coast View, the show that every single day celebrates the men and women who are making coastal Mississippi such an amazing place to live, work, and play. And so if you are a regular listener of Coast View, you've heard me have a visit from a woman by the name of Laurie Jackson. Laurie is an independent um, uh, missionary who lives in Ukraine. I met her through a cousin who has uh, uh, adopted two boys from Ukraine. And uh, Laurie is part of an effort that's taking place as we speak in Western Ukraine, where they're putting together this almost like Red Cross effort, but it's this you know, mismatch of people that kind of found each other. And they're doing some amazing work. And if you've heard those conversations, you know what I'm talking about. But I said after I talked to Laurie that they are us. I, I think about the people of Ukraine and how much they love their community. And I said to them, uh, Andre and Sasha, two of, two of her Ukrainian friends that joined us, on Coastview uh, with her, uh, that um, that buildings don't make a community; the people do. And when you, the more you converse with them, the more you understand that the Ukrainians are a lot like coastal Mississippians in that way. So I want to share with you an uh, a um, update that she did, and tell me if you don't think of us when you, when I read this. And by the way, they've changed; they they have a name for their effort. It's called the UA Ants. Our UA is, uh, is, is you know, just uh, um, it obviously stands for Ukraine, but UA ants. And here's here's what she said. Remember when you were a kid and you would kick an ant hill and watch the ants scatter? It's a fast. It's fascinating, really. And what they are doing is, is interesting too. They are not fleeing. They are rebuilding together. This is exactly what we saw happen the day rockets hit our capital of Kiev. People came out of the woodwork. We were scared and unsure what would come next, but it wasn't chaos or panic or even man for himself, you might expect. It was immediate phone calls to friends and family to make sure they were okay, to make sure they knew and asked what their plan was and how were they going to help each other. And I'm not talking about just about us. I'm talking about not just our group, but it felt that the whole country responded in this way. David, our youth pastor and good friend and fellow aunt, was the first I heard say this interview with God TV a couple of days after we made our way to Western Ukraine, that Ukrainians were like ants just coming out everywhere to help. I think Sasha, and by the way, Sasha was one of the young men who was on Coast View with us last week, heard him say it too, and it sort of became an inside joke. Um, and so she goes on to talk about you know how their effort evolved from wanting a hotel uh, to, to finding vans, to all this work that they did. What they said, they, they became uh, to, to, to it became our defenders having people willing to bring them gear they need, tourniquets and meds and bulletproof vests, but they don't have a way to get it themselves. And each person stepped into a role, many in roles that look very different from the roles that they did before the war. And in our case, like, for example, Sasha, was a videographer and Andre was a software developer and now they're driving trucks and gathering supplies and doing all that stuff. Um, a new friend asked the other day, how did you all make that happen in 23 days? And she, and then of course, uh, Lori talks about it, the, the, their strong Christian beliefs and felt like that the Lord really helped guide them and uh, they're working so hard. But she, she went on to kind of close it with this at the end. Heal analogy for us is not just about response to attack or survival. It is a symbol of hope. Have you watched how ants rebuild their home after it, it's been kicked down? This is our hope. Together un until victory and together to we rebuild. And she signed it with the ants. Man, I can't help but think about coastal Mississippi after Katrina and the way we rebuild. I mean, I'm not trying to compare the situation that they're facing now with what we faced after Katrina. But when you look at the human spirit and the sense of buildings don't make a community, the people do, they're not going to let go. We didn't let go of coast of Mississippi, and they're not going to let go of Ukraine. And I believe that's going to be one of the stories to uh, the, the, the ultimate story when we look back is the Ukrainian people could not be beat. Bottom line, they're not going to be beat. And it's just really an inspiring very inspiring story. We'll have uh, Laura Jackson back on Coast View in the next week or so. Hey, if you've been paying attention, you may have noticed that there was a New Yorker story that was written by a guy named Jonathan Hare back in 1999. It was about a really uh, a groundbreaking case back in the late 1990s 
where um, uh, it was a story about about Jerry O'Keefe, the late owner of the Bradford O'Keefe Funeral Home, the former mayor of Biloxi, and a battle that he had with an insurance company. And I'm going to tell you more about it here in just a second. You probably have seen a lot about it, but if you missed it, it's a great story. And I want to invite my friend uh, Jeffrey O'Keefe, whose father, Jerry O'Keefe, is, is what this movie is sort of centered around, uh, to, to Cozy. How you doing, buddy? Welcome back. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Ricky. I appreciate that. You know, it's a lot of excitement with the movie going on, and uh, uh, we appreciate you uh, having us on to talk about it a little bit. Yeah. Hey, listen, before we get to the movie, which is, you know, it's, it's got Tommy Lee Jones playing your dad. And of course, Jamie Foxx is in there as the, as the, as the, uh, the, the uh, lawyer. Um, there are another cast of characters. We'll come back to that in a second. How are you guys doing? I, I noticed that um, when, one of the things that you and I talked about before is that your, your business, like every other business, had to make adjustments during COVID. Uh, but you sort of figured it out. How, how are you guys doing these days? Well, we're doing okay, I would say. Uh, I believe we're uh, able to meet the needs of the families that we're serving. And uh, thank goodness uh, a lot of uh, the COVID uh, uh, impact has eased now. And so uh, it's refreshing to be able to go back out uh, to gatherings and uh, and, and really have uh, services uh, to uh, tr pay tribute to one's life when we uh, when we do have a service and and so it's yeah. uh, it's great to be able to you know have families uh, have an opportunity to celebrate those lives again. Yeah, no. So you know, COVID was so disruptive in so many ways, and to think about how difficult it was when uh, a loved one passed during COVID, especially during the time when you couldn't gather. I mean, part of the grieving process is the need to bring the community together. And there were just so many limitations. It was so tough on everybody. But I, oh, I know I you got, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Even worse than that was uh, when, when uh, fa families had uh, loved ones who were ill and then infirmed in hospital situations and they weren't even permitted to you know, to be there and love on them and hug them and, and give them that uh, personal support that so many families uh, need in a, in a situation like that. So so not only was it uh, disruptive afterward, but but that, that, that I really feel for those people that uh, couldn't be with their loved ones. Well, look, um, we're going to shift gears. It's good to hear that you guys have um, sort of stayed the course and or back to playing your important role in the community with your Bradford O'Keefe Funeral Homes. Um, hey, listen, later in my career, when I left the Sun-Herald, I went to work for Advanced Condé Nast. And Condé Nast is the is very, is the second largest privately owned company in the United States and has a long list of uh, magazines they publish, Vanity Fair, The New Yorker, GQ, Architectural Digest. Got, and one of their, one of their and they, by the way, they publish in every continent in the world. And uh, one of their one of their you know prized possessions is the New Yorker, and New Yorker is really really famous for having incredible writing. And so when that story was written by Jonathan Har Hare, I guess H A R R, back uh, in nineteen Har Har, yeah Jonathan yeah, Har, back in uh, nineteen ninety nine, I remember it extraordinarily well, extremely well written. Um, but I bet in your mind, you had no idea that it would inspire someone along the way to want to do a movie about your father. It's amazing, well, isn't it? It, it? it is. It is. It was uh, actually uh, that whole concept had been discussed pretty early on because it was a landmark case. I think at the time it might have been the second largest verdict in the nation, uh, actually. And uh, and so he had uh, my father and uh and the attorney, Willie Gary, had been approached early on about the possibility of, uh, of a screenplay with that, you know. And so uh, I, I think what uh, I'm not quite sure, you know, what may have delayed uh, the production for 27 years. But but uh, but nevertheless, uh, I know it wasn't too long after the heels of uh, the, the tobacco verdict and whatnot, which was kind of a similar type of situation. And so I don't know if that had something to play into the matter. I'm really not sure. But but it was uh, it, it was a riveting case. Uh, no doubt about it. 
Hey, so uh, we're, we're going to get into some of the details of it here shortly. We're kind of getting close to the end of this segment. But um, it, is, um, it is a case that for the better part of your formative years, in the beginning part of your career, sort of consumed. I mean, I bet for, for years it was sort of at the center of your world, wasn't it? It was a uh, drawn out matter, no doubt about it, Ricky. This uh, this this whole matter went on uh, probably uh, four and a half years prior to uh, the hiring of Willie Gary. Which, by the way, the movie itself is really kind of focused on Willie. He's he's kind of a uh, rags to you know success story uh, out of Stewart, Florida, and it really kind of focuses on. Uh, you know his uh, dynamic and charismatic uh, personality, but uh, so Jeff, Jeff let's let's do this. We're coming to the end of the segment. When we come back with Jeffrey O'Keefe, what we're going to do is kind of break it all down. What was the case all about? And then we'll talk more about the movie and some of the characters in the movie and where it's being filmed, etc. Uh, we'll see you after this break. Good morning and welcome back to Coast View. We're visiting with Jeffrey O'Keefe, my friend Jeff. We've been. We've known each other for a long time, and he's the head of the uh, Bradford O'Keefe Funeral Home Organization and someone who's been on Coast View before. And we're talking about the incredible movie that is currently being filmed about his father and Willie Gary, the, his lawyer. And uh, so it's going to be a great movie, you know, great characters. And we'll come back to the movie in a second. But let's remind people about the case. What, what was the case about? And this incredible verdict for, as you pointed out at the time, was, was a record verdict, or at least maybe the second hot biggest verdict of over $500 million. Tell me, tell me about the case, Jeffrey. Well, I mean, it was uh, basically uh, originally a breach of contract case. And of course, the, the movie itself is uh, taken some liberties it's it's kind of a they're uh, you know they have the right to interject fiction and they're doing that to heighten uh, uh, you know I guess the uh, message that they're wanting to portray in the movie but but nevertheless it, it was a breach of contract case and uh, it was a, a long and protracted trial and of course as I mentioned it was four and a half years uh, leading up to the trial itself uh, and, and so there was a lot of moving parts uh, over those four and a half years and uh, as it went into trial. But uh, but but there were uh, a lot of uh, predatory trade practices that were uh, revealed, uh, which uh, incensed the jury uh, that mm -hmm. a corporation would systematically be doing this. And I think that is the basis of uh, of their, you know, the punishment that they levied. They wanted to send a message about that, uh, the handling of people that way. So, so, okay, remind people, so there's a breach of contract, but this Canadian funeral company, it, tell us how this whole thing started. Um, and, then, and then we'll get to the breach of contract aspect of it. Well, essentially they acquired a funeral home that we had a contractual agreement with for them to continue to produce life insurance comp into my dad's company, and and essentially that contract was breached. They came in and said, "Hey, we're not we're not going to do that anymore." Even though uh, there was a contract that had been ratified three different times over the years, and so it all started out just to be uh, the pursuance of the resolution of that, you know. And and of course, uh, Mr. Lowen was insistent upon our family selling our, our business as a means to settle it, which, you know, it, they weren't for sale. So, so, uh, so that wasn't going to be the resolution. But we did reach a point where we entered a settlement agreement, and then they breached that too. And so that's what really kind of lofted the depth of uh, the predatory practice uh, in one sense. And then when it came to trial, which, by the way, it was like an eight week long trial. And, uh, you know, really, really and truly, Ricky, I mean, Amazon's doing a beautiful job. They've got a tremendous cast. But I'm telling you, you're getting a snippet. I mean, this thing went on for four and a half years before going to trial in the fifth year. There were years of ramification impact after that uh, throughout the industry. And, uh, 
and of course, this particular movie is focusing on the trial itself, and uh, and it, it, you know, it's going to be a great story, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, but it, you know, it is fictional. I, I want to say that. I mean, you know, Tommy Lee Jones. We went down to the set, my brother and I, a weekend before last, and we met a lot of the kids. Tommy Lee Jones walked up to my brother and I said, "Now look." When you see this movie, you're not going to be seeing your dad, you know. <laughs> he knows it's a, you know. I mean, I think you know he he, he knows how to study a a, a role he's going to cast, and he knows the role he's not he's playing is not my dad, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah. Hey, so, using, so coming back to the case, though, what I remember, and of course, I became publisher of the Sun here in 2001, so I followed this case over those all those years both uh, through the press and through your father. Your father was locked and loaded, though. He was not giving up, was he? I mean, this was a story of determination, wasn't it? Well, the facts were on our side. And uh, and so uh, we knew, you know, that the, the contract had been breached and then a, breached, a, a secondary contract was breached. And, um, you know, no, I mean, uh, you know, my father, you know, and, and here again, the, the you know, the Lowen group was just con continually consistent on, well, uh, uh, you know, you need to sell your funeral homes as a resolution to this matter. And, and we just weren't going to do that. And, and we wanted resolution on the matter. But but uh, my father, you know, attempted to settle all along the way, which is a, a little different twist in the movie, of course, you know, but. Uh, but that's okay. You know, I mean, it's all right. It's going to be a good story. It's going to be a great movie, I think. Yeah, I've been watching updates, actually, from the film set. And uh, Jamie Foxx has been doing a good job of kind of posting how things are going. It's clear It's clear that he, of course, you know, Tommy Lee Jones is, is the real deal as an actor. But Jamie Foxx uh, is super focused on this role. I mean, it's a serious movie. It's not. It's not a... It's not a uh, you know just a little flash in the pan type of movie. They're 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 putting some heavyweights behind this. Well, it's uh, you know as I say, the weekend we were down there, uh, it, it was uh, Willie Gary was uh, also in town, and uh, he's he's going to have. I don't want to give out too much, but he's going to have a little cameo role in the movie, and uh, and so we were uh, you know there to be able to uh, see that little snippet and whatnot, and uh, we had dinner with him and dinner with the amazon people as well it was just a real nice weekend well that's cool that's that's really cool so they 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 treated you guys well and gave you a good behind the scenes look at things yes they did they did and as i say that's that's where we kind of glean the storyline role and uh uh, it, it's, you know there's a lot of ways to tell the story it's not the way i personally would have told the story but but hey that's hollywood you know so uh <laughs> Oh, good. Yeah, they always take creative freedom. That's just the way it works. That's just the way it works. You know, I'm amazed. You, you, when you talk about the Amazon folks, it's amazing to me the amount of money, billions and billions of dollars being spent on content today. You know, movies, streaming movies and big screen movies. And this is this is a good time to be in the in the film business, I think. You know, hey, did they did they tell you why they didn't choose some of it to be filmed in Mississippi? Uh, mainly it's the uh, tax credits that are available uh, for filming in Louisiana that was the primary draw. And plus, uh, people are coming from New York, uh, Los Angeles. It's uh, obviously, a, a, you know, a bigger hub, uh, you know, to uh, delve into there. And, and uh, I think it, uh, because of this being centered around a legal matter, there were a lot of resources for uh, I, I do believe they built a set down there. So, uh, yeah, I don't. I, I really think that the primary reason was the uh, the tax credits involved with uh, with that filming. So uh, maybe that's something we got to work on a little harder in Mississippi. Yeah, you know what's interesting? I've had the head of the film effort for Mississippi. He works with the MDA, and uh, Mississippi actually has done pretty good in the film area. Um, we're not ultimately competitive with something like a New Orleans situation, but sometimes we, we can stand head to head, to, head to head with them. But just overall, the number of uh, the amount of content coming out of Mississippi is up dramatically and they continue to, to do really well. And uh, I think they're always talking about it. How can they 
put more incentives on the table because you know, that's a big deal. I mean, that's with so much content, as we just mentioned, happening across the United States. It's super competitive, just like if you're trying to get a business to locate in your community. They're, they pay attention to things like what the incentives are uh, because it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, there's no sure thing when you when you do a movie. Some movies make it, some don't. And uh, and it's it's a risky business, and so they they're really interested in the bottom line. That that is for sure. Um, so so Jeffrey, uh, when did they tell you when they think they're they're going to wrap up the the filming and what the what the well, planned date is? They're going to complete filming uh, around the end of April, and uh, and I I believe they're hoping to release the the film around the end of the year, is what I understand. But uh, those are some generalized uh, targets, I'm sure. Uh, you know how things go, but uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be very interesting. And uh, as I say, it's it's not a documentary, but it's uh, it, it should be an entertaining film. Hey, listen, I wanted before we leave, I wanted to mention that I saw where your son had posted on Facebook about some tattered flags that he had seen in the neighborhood, and really urged people to let him help and let you guys help them dispose of those flags um, properly. Uh, in the short time we have left, tell me about that. Well, it's just a program that we have to uh, offer to help families dispose of a tattered flag. And and uh, essentially, we uh, use those to cover a veteran who, who may not have a flag uh, through our uh, crematory. You know, we put the first crematorium in the state of Mississippi, and it's just a nice way to... Uh, to dispose of those flags. And so we encourage uh, that methodology of disposal. And, and of course, uh, they could be dropped off of it. any of our uh, seven locations along the coast. That, well, thank you. And it, obviously, your dad was an, a, a World War II veteran. And he was a decorated fighter pilot. And, uh, man, you know, he was in the House of Representatives. He was, he was the, the mayor of Biloxi. But this notion of of uh, making sure that flags that are that are ready to be retired are retired properly and used in some sort of honoring way. It's a, it's a great service that you provide for the community. And I want to urge people who have not taken you up on your offer to, to make sure that, that flags are disposed of properly. Anyway, it's been great to catch up with you about the film. Glad things are going well for you. Have a great day, Jeffrey. I appreciate you, my friend. Having us there, Ricky. Appreciate you. You bet. This has been Jeffrey O'Keefe, and we'll see you after this break.